All right, welcome everyone to the June 2nd Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee call. Um, as you are all aware, two things that we must abide by. The first is the antitrust policy notice that is currently displayed on the screen. And the second is the code of conduct that is linked in our agenda. Uh, so as far as announcements go, we have our standard uh, Dev Weekly developer newsletter that goes out each Friday. Uh, if you have anything that you would like included in that, please uh, leave a comment on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. Um, and then does anybody else have any other announcements that they would like to make? No, okay. Uh, so for quarterly reports, uh, we have the Hyperledger Cello report that came in this week. Um, as far as I could see, um, we only had the one question that I put in and um, Mawa has responded with that, uh, with an answer to that. So I don't see any additional comments, but I also only see that two of us have had a chance to review this. So uh, given that, I will leave this on the agenda for next week so that uh, everybody on the TSC will have a chance to review that particular report. And then uh, the Firefly report is coming due next week. Um, and so we'll look to, to see that coming in. Any comments on the quarterly reports? No, okay. Um, so as you guys may have seen, I did send a follow-up email to Quilt. Um, their quarterly report was coming up, I think next week or maybe it was this week. And so I sent them an email um, asking if they wanted to keep the project in a dormant state or um, move it to end of life. And they um, responded with it it was probably time to move it to an end of life state. Uh, so I created a PR specifically in the quilt uh, repo and uh, it was approved by, um, approved and merged by um, the maintainers. So uh, I just wanted to make sure that we were aware of that and uh, just get a, maybe a, a yay nay vote uh, just to, to confirm that we are moving that to end of life uh, from the TSC. Any comments before we have that vote? Nathan? Oh, just for the record, the, the quilt project came out of the web payments working group at the W3C and did a lot of interesting things for identifiers um, for blockchains that track financial assets. Um, and it has done a lot of uh, interesting thought work um, that affected what we chose to do with identity, especially when we worked on um, cross chain identifier work for the did specification. So uh, big thanks to everyone who worked on the quilt project and brought it to its current state, um, but it hasn't been active for quite some time as uh, Tracy very well knows. Um, and so uh, it was good to see that folks were around to reply to the, the pull requests to move to a, uh, an end of life state. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Nathan. Um, as, as we've said um, in the past to the other projects that have gone to end of life state, um, you know, obviously, thank you for being part of the community to the Hyperledger Quilt folks. Um, if they were to ever listen to this in the future, um, and uh, thank you for the work that they have done on that project and, and working towards bringing Interledger to Hyperledger. Any other comments? Okay, uh, Rai, would you just take us through a not a roll call vote, but just a an approve or abstain type vote. Sure. Uh, well, the, nobody, there's no motion to vote on and nobody seconded the non-motion. Oh, thank you, Ryan. Yeah. That. 
It's so early here. <laughs> Peter seconded. <laughs> what do you want to have first? <laughs> I'll make the motion thing as I help approve the pull request. All right. Thanks, David. Okay. I'll second. <laughs> so uh, in the matter for the TSC moving uh, quilt to end of life, uh, is there anyone who wishes to abstain from the vote? Is there anyone that objects or wishes to vote nay? All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes by voice vote. All right, thanks, Ray. Yep. Thanks for keeping me honest too. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, so in the discussion items, I just wanted to call out specifically that we have had two PRs that ended up getting merged into the TSC repo. Um, one to rename CII to open SSF. Um, and the other to add the security related mandates for graduation to the yeah, incubation extra criteria. So um, I wanted to see if anybody had any comments here at the TSC about those particular PRs, um, because I know that they didn't go through a formal vote here, but really just went through the, the GitHub um, PR process. So if anybody has any comments, now is probably a good time to have those comments. Okay. Um, so that is, as far as I know, the end of the normal TSC meeting. But if anybody has any other items that we should talk about before we hand it over to Jim, uh, raise your hand and let us know. All right, so Jim, I think it's uh, up to you uh, to work us through the, the task force on Project Health. All right, thanks, Tracy. Um, you share my screen. Okay, so... Um... We didn't we didn't have a uh, off cycle meeting, um, but we did have a lot of good discussions uh, in the last task force meeting in, in this TSC time slot uh, that was in uh, in April. So just as a refresher, uh, we went through the uh, all the dimensions that we believe are important uh, to reflect uh, a project's health. And that's in this column. Uh, it's in two uh, large categories, uh, focusing on the community side or focusing on the code side. On the, on the community side, we had uh, growth as one uh, dimension and diversity, retention, maturity, friendless, uh, friendliness, and responsiveness. On the code side, we had usefulness, uh, production readiness, fundamental metrics, docs, and amount of innovation. Um, for this call, um, I'd like us to discuss, um, given these dimensions, what type of data do we think are um, uh, useful to support, um, to support them uh, so we can get some measure uh, from data to reflect uh, on each um, dimension. Before we dive into that, uh, any questions on um, any aspect um, that we discussed last time? So all together, I see there are, uh, there are 11 of them. No, that's great. Okay, so let's dive in. So um, I've got a bunch of um, uh, ideas. Um, so we can go through them, and if you don't think they make sense, uh, we can strike them out. Uh, or if you have uh, additional ideas, then we should add them in. So uh, let me put this in edit. Okay, for project growth, um, we want this to be reflecting um, how many people uh, are becoming newly interested in this project and they're so interested that they start uh, contributing either in discussing new features, um, discussing drawbacks, uh, or even contributing code. 
So <clears throat> I was thinking we can um, tally the definitely uh, mostly driven by uh, GitHub uh, data, um, number of contributors to the code base, um, scraping the, the PR uh, data and issues data uh, that where people log uh, requirements um, or uh, just submit a bug report. Um, don't know if there are specific things we, we need to look at um, for both PRs and issues uh, to get real contribution versus, um, you know, casual one-time thing and then they, ne they never came back. Uh, I know Tracy did a lot of work in this area to try to uh, use PR and issues data in GitHub to, to define who are the casual ones, who are the, uh, the, the, the strong uh, contributors and who are the uh, uh, recurring uh, or repeated contributors. So all that work can be uh, applied here. Um, also, we want to look at um, Discord if possible. Um, so here, I think we need to consider technical feasibilities. Um, is it possible um, to uh, to analyze Discord and see um, for a particular project which user you know keeps showing up week after week uh, and have sustained discussions? Um, that can be a good indicator of uh, contributors that are mostly contributing uh, ideas uh, in discussions rather than code. So do, do these make sense for growth? So Hart has his hand up. So okay. first of all, uh, a somewhat orthogonal practical question. Uh, where should we be commenting in chat for this discussion? Um, I'm assuming we wanna do Discord, but do we wanna do in the TSC chat or the, uh, the related task force chat? Uh, let's go ahead and use the task force chat. Um, there's one uh, Tracy created for uh, the health data. Okay, yeah, I see it. Great. Um, and secondly, I, I think this is a great start, Jim. Um, I would also include other things like uh, documentation. You know, are people working on that? Um, and, you know, I guess community outreach. So, um, are people starting to do like meetups? You know, is there, you know, uh, outside evangelism, I guess, however outside evangelism takes place? Um, thanks. Um, can, can you clarify the, um, uh, the meetup, the outside evangelism uh, aspect? You mean people leading, for example, uh, in the particular region, meetups that focus on on Firefly. Recently, sure. yeah, been, absolutely. Uh, okay, understood. Like, are people trying to grow the project? Basically, yeah. You know, this is like you know, just things we know that generally work to help get more contributors. Like these things are are people doing them? Yeah, that makes sense. That's a good one, um, and I think. This will be mostly just asking people, right? And, and have a place to uh, to log them. Sure, well, I mean, these should all be logged in our events, right? That's true. Not yeah. there aren't always, I mean, it's certainly people occasionally do things on their own, uh, but whenever, uh, whenever people host a meetup or something, you know, we encourage them to, to tell us, right? So do you think um, the, the outside evangelism is a, um, it, it, it is, is data to collect it um, or it's just means to an end? Because at the end of the day, if uh, at the end of the day, it should be reflected in the growth of the, the contributors in, in these um, areas, right? Well, I think it's a 
it's a leading factor for those, right? So if I want to be able to, you know, if I want to anticipate how I think growth is going to be in the future, I think looking at that is really important. Okay. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. If, if a project is not getting um, exposures through these meetups, then we probably should encourage them because it's, um, as you said, it's a, it's, it's a good way to lead up to the, to the appearance of additional uh, contributors. Yeah, so the, the earlier stuff is sort of, you know, has the project grown? And like the meetup kind of thing is, will the project grow basically, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then Jim, I think that. Jim uh, I think maybe to figure out who the new interested individuals are, if we could do some sort of page view count on the contributing.md file, or if there's a different contributing um, that's in the document for the particular project, um, that could be a way of seeing how many people have expressed an interest by looking at the contributing guide instead of just reaching out on discord or doing a pr um, because that could then tell you how many people end up converting based on somebody goes to the contributing guide do they actually end up submitting a pr or not so um the contributor guide uh, is that in our wiki or is it um so, so according to our, uh, I don't remember what we call it, but the, the folder requirements were all, each of the projects is supposed to have a contributing .md file um, mm -hmm. as a initial entry point. Some of those actually have uh, text directly in them and some of them point to a uh, contributing a file on their read the docs or something like that. So, yeah. um, I, obviously that's that becomes a, a slightly bigger challenge when you're redirecting yeah. um, to a different page but uh, yeah I, I think you know we at least have the requirement that everybody has a contributing.md in their repo okay yeah I think that's a that's a good idea uh, may be able to collect page views in some of them uh, may not be possible in others depending on where they exist Cool. Anything else on this particular one? I know every as a TSC, this is our this is our main uh, interest is the growth of the community. So I think any ideas that we're not thinking, uh, we should talk about them. Okay, so let's move on to diversity. Diversity is also very important. Um, we want this is uh, fault tolerance, right? <laughs> when one organization for whatever reason goes away, it'll having diversity will uh, keep the project alive. Um, so the number of, obviously number of orgs uh, contributing to the code base, that's probably the most obvious um, uh, type of data we should collect. Um, do we have anything else? that we should think about. In the uh, fabric reports, I usually put percent of commits and contributors from each organization. Well, I, I usually focus it on IBM because that's by far the most usually. So I'll say like how much percent is IBM, how much percent is other. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, David. That's, uh, that's a good point. And David. One other form of diversity could be uh, uh, language translations, for example, and how many languages are document is documentation available in. Although I guess that could also fall under perhaps, you know, uh, um, friendliness. Yeah, that's, that's a good one, David. I think uh, contributing issues is also important. 
Um, so sort of trying to measure who's contributing to the roadmap, not only who's contributing the code. So that would be also um, issues and Discord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But the the thing I want to emphasize is that you know it's people who are also contributing to the roadmap, not just the code itself, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If if yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And for the else? for the projects that have the RFCs, um, that could be a good repo to take a look at to see who the contributions are coming from in there. Uh, RFCs or uh, enhancement requests, basically. And, right? Yeah, yeah. I just know a num number of our projects have a, a distinct repo for RFCs, um, and so for those projects. If only one organization is contributing to that repo, then maybe that there's not the diversity uh, for the roadmap that Hart is talking about. That's a very important um, uh, aspect. Uh, thanks, Tracy. Yeah, mm -hmm. we actually had, uh, as an example, Firefly had a separate example uh, repo for Firefly improvement request fire. And we've had um, many uh, opened by by other orgs, very significant architecture um, discussions. That's a good one. Okay, so if that's it for that one, let's move on to retention. So this is about uh, keeping um, keep attracting the interest of contributors. Um, longevity. Um, so having, uh, having the contributors that we uh, recorded from those efforts, uh, do they continue to show up um, month after month, both in uh, PRs and Discord? I guess it's the same type of data, but a different, but a different, um, a different way to analyze them. Uh, we could do something around so for uh, retention. I previously had in the project reports the number of people have become inactive in the last uh, month, uh, meaning that they hadn't made a contribution in over six months. Um, as well as the um, kind of number of repeat contributors that you have. Uh, like if, if somebody's only contributed once, then I, I think that's, you know, it's good, but it's not what we're looking for. It's somebody who continues to come back and uh, contribute. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's continue uh, for maturity. So maturity is mainly um, as we're going through the uh, analysis of these dimensions, maturity should be a, um, uh, should be a uh, sort of a qualifier uh, so that um, maybe on the particular aspect, it should be treated differently for a young project versus a uh, versus a mature project. Um, and maturity, it's probably a, a subjective thing that is not directly uh, correlated to age, but we could definitely look at when was the first line of code or first commit uh, was started. That's the start of life. Um, and frequency of releases um, could reflect um, the maturity of the project. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know if that's um, 
uh, we probably can have a discussion about this. Uh, the idea was um, mature projects tend to have more regular cadence, um, and they usually can do the release on that uh, on the cadence. Active projects may have faster cadence, but they they tend to be more um, irregular, uh, more on demand, and certainly. Um, less active and less mature pro projects will have uh, less amount of uh, releases. So uh, longer cadence uh, between releases. Does this make sense? Do we think that's a fair um, way to analyze maturity? So I know you have your hand up, but it was probably before this question, so. Oh, no, it was for this question, but thanks, okay. Tracy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think the frequency of releases is a good metric of maturity. It's not necessarily like, you know, are you releasing every week? But, you know, do you have a schedule and are you roughly adhering to that schedule? So I think that's a great thing, Jim, and I, you know, you should leave it in. Um, on the other hand, I think other things that are, are great indicators of maturity are documentation. Um, I consider, you know, I don't consider a, a project mature unless it has, you know, at least reasonable documentation. Um, and finally, like, you know, certain uh, best practices come to mind. Like, I would not consider a project mature, for instance, if it were not following the best security practices. Uh, things like that, right? Um, security practices are the, the ones that, you know, come to mind to me, but I'm sure there are other others that, that people could think of and suggest. It could also include the test coverage, the, the way um, any new code gets added or the release process the definition for somebody to become com maintainers from committing uh, single patches. To uh, <clears throat> automatically calculate test coverage, making sure they're not dropping, that sort of thing. It, it, so since we are looking at and so maturity of the project, it would also, a mature project would have, so best practices can span across spectrum. That would include uh, the the way they engaged with the community members. Uh, uh, the last part you said, can you repeat that? Sure. So um, I was thinking more in terms of following best practices that will have a roadmap for somebody to become a maintainer if they want right. to start contributing. Gotcha. And Nathan? Arun touches on something that's even more important here, but it's harder, a lot harder to measure. And that is, does the community have some cross organizational way of organizing their progress? I mean, do they have some sort of roadmap or active and regular discussions on what should and shouldn't be built and when? Um, and that, I don't know that that's a metric um, or if it's kind of a pass fail of, is there such a thing that we, can ask or watch for. You mean, uh, uh, is the um, is the leaders involving the community in defining the roadmap? Yeah, like uh, the example here is I show up with really great new idea to improve your project. Where do I go? Who do I talk to? How do I find that out? It, what, what's the what's the cross organizational way of coordinating? Should it go in this sprint or should it go in next quarter? Yeah, so we have um, I feel like this is somewhat adjacent to uh, friendliness uh, to contributors, uh, but I don't think it's captured anywhere else. Uh, I'll leave this in, uh, in in here. That's a good one. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, 
Okay, so let's move on to the next one, friendliness. Um, this is uh, uh, for contributors, potential contributors who have good ideas. Uh, do they feel they are being accommodated and they can have meaningful discussions? Um, so some obvious things is, uh, does the project define good first uh, issues? Uh, these are things to help uh, potential uh, contributors uh, get their hands dirty, just go through the basic practices of doing a build and making a small fix and then um, propose a PR uh, uh, as easy as possible. Once someone has been able to go, go through this end-to-end, -end, it's much more likely they, can, they will contribute more in the future. So that's, um, that should be a really good thing. Um, can be measured in uh, our, our new contributors being onboarded um, week after week. Um, next one is a bit subjective. Can new ideas be accommodated? Uh, even, even if they may lead to forking up the code base. Um, this was actually discussed uh, on the last call. Um, having robust discussions um, uh, to solve concerns from the community uh, rather than brushing them off, um, encourage them to create a new fork uh, if this is this is uh, th if this can't be accommodated uh, in the same code base, um, that reflects, you know, that the the core um, committers really care about um, those new ideas from new contributors. Yeah, so I, I think this is actually really important, and you're you're touching on a, a core fact here, Jim. So one of the things that I really like to see is sort of how far out of the way are existing maintainers willing to go to help new contributors. So it's sort of like if a new contributor submits like a flawed issue or a flawed PR, you know, how far are the maintainers uh, willing to go to help them, right? So I will credit Peter is someone who does an excellent job here. When someone comes along to Cactus with something that's not, you know, perfect, Peter will usually go out of his way to help them a lot. Uh, and, and that's really fantastic. And that's really good for the community. Um, so one metric for, for sort of this, um, and that's sort of indicative of this is, uh, you know, what's the time to land PRs or commits or issues, but, but mostly PRs for sort of core maintainers or core contributors versus new contributors, right? So, uh, you know, are the, are the maintainers, you know, addressing the, the actions created by new contributors? Um, and, and I think this is really important. I hope that made sense. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, um, so we're we're I think we're actually talking about a um, um, an idea. I I don't know if we actually talked about how this would be captured, the type of data that needs to be collected uh, to to reflect this. So I think you could correct. You could collect this. You know, in some way, like you know. Uh, the, the PR or the issue analytics from new contributors versus existing contributors, right? Now you would expect it to be a little faster for existing contributors than new contributors, but you don't want it to be like galactic for new contributors, right? Where if someone like creates a PR and it's just never looked at, right? Yeah. Or like PRs closed without comment is another like thing that's mm -hmm. you know that that I, I personally discourage. Um, yeah. Go 
right? And, and then, I guess, sorry. Jim, I was just going to say, I added the last line to kind of capture what Hart said there. And I also add it to the first line. Um, besides good first issues, a help wanted tag. I think if you have help wanted, that implies that you have somebody who's willing to help you in uh, in going through the the PR process and working through a particular issue together. Um, so mm -hmm. I added that to uh, the friendliness as well. Yeah, saw that. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, this yeah. this makes sense. Arun. Thanks, Tracy. So I think Hart covered one of the questions that I wanted to ask: that how long a PR would take from a new contributor, and how far is the maintainer going to do help them out? The second part to that is with with respect to taking in inputs from the new contributors or taking in new ideas, right? That's topic that Jim also kind of brought up. I know in the past people used to ask questions on rocket chart and that used to lead to discussions and eventually maintainers, if they like it, they would go and uh, add that feature or if they don't, they would probably discuss and say hey, that we are not going to take do anything with that. Um, and then we decided that we'll go with raising issues with all the repositories, but I don't think so that's consistently enabled across all projects because some of the projects are still not using uh, GitHub issues as a source for taking in inputs. I know some other some of them are strictly following it. So I think that's also a measure of friendliness of there should be a consistent way where somebody can come in and say this needs to be done and probably start a discussion around that. So um, Rune, you're saying is the project um, uh, defining a clear way for anybody to to um, uh, raise a concern or, 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 or an idea? Sure, it, we can consider that. I know some of the projects may still be preferring an external tool like Jira. So uh, another thing that I think could be useful for measuring this is sort of uh, are PRs and other issues and things addressed in a somewhat uh, FIFO manner? Um, mm. So, you know, basically like maybe they're not getting merged, but, you know, are people sort of, you know, commenting on and reviewing things uh, in the order that they're coming in? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like this, right? So nobody should um, sure. um well, should, yeah. should uh cut the line because you're a core core committer. I mean, obviously not all PRs are equal, right? You know, if there's like a security fix. It's not the same as, uh, you know, an improvement, right? But in general, the you, and and some PRs are good and some PRs are you know less good, right? Uh, but in general, there should be some sort of process of addressing things in order, right? Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Great ideas. Um, anything else? Arun. Arun. Right, so I think since we are talking about friendliness, should we also consider uh, the project meetings? I know all projects are advised to have their own uh, maintainer meeting or maybe committers meeting gatherings that happen at the bi-weekly or once in a month. Other uh, project meetings. Uh, right. This captures uh, your idea, Arun? Right. Okay, great. Nathan? I just wanted to add to the address to an order. Um, 
uh, it, it's not so much about that they're addressed necessarily in chronological order, but that there, there is a defined order and that every organization has fair access to that order. Um, an example of what we've seen in the past where a, a process is broken is where the primary organization where all the maintainers are set their own internal corporate roadmap and everything for that happens like clockwork on schedule. But anybody who comes with a change from outside of the organization, they have to wait through an undefined other process. So you might see a pull request or pull requests get merged in two or three hours when they're part of that org, but three or four days if they're outside. Enjoy, Steve. So, um, Nathan, you're you're saying uh, there should be a um, a well-defined practice to define how the, the party list of issues to be revealed. Yeah, um, it, but but yeah. it doesn't have to be chronologically. It just has to be fair and you know obvious. Meaning if I come with a critical security patch, of course that might get merged well, well before, you know, someone's idea to add a new API. Thanks for adding that, Nathan. Um, shall we move on to the next one? I, I feel more and more uh, that <laughs> responsiveness becomes very similar to friendliness. Um, maybe we should consider merging them, but responsiveness is mainly how, how quickly things are done, um, uh, especially in terms of um, when they come from outside, quote unquote, outside. Uh, outside of the core maintainers group. Um, it's very similar to friendliness because when you are responsive, uh, you are demonstrating a friendliness to new contributors. And of course you are, you are responsive to within the uh, core maintainers group because everybody wants to, to get the right thing done. Um, so shall we go ahead and merge uh, responsiveness and friendliness into a single one? So I think this is useful to separate. I think Nathan illustrated it really well when he mentioned that there's, you know, there can be a core group of maintainers that are very responsive to each other, but not necessarily uh, responsive to, to outside contributors. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also seen projects where the maintainers are very slow to respond to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's fine to have this as a um, gotcha. as its own category. So basically, this is looking across the board um, how, in general, things get get done. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Let's keep them separate still. Um, so that <clears throat> uh, applies to both PRs and issues in GitHub and also on uh, questions that are not responded to. Um, how do we know if that's even possible to measure? Like, can, can, we, can we tell the difference between some, somebody making a comment or just a statement versus asking a question in Discord? And if there's no reply, um, this, this seems to involve some sort of uh, AI to, to actually understand if questions in Discord are being addressed or not, right? Yeah, so I, Nathan, you had your hand up before that question. Um, I don't know if anybody has a good answer for your question too, but Nathan. Oh. I was going to say, I don't have a good answer to that question. I think you're right. I'm not sure how much you can automate that, though there might be some best practice of how you, we should acknowledge every post in some way, and we could train the maintainers on that so that it could be measurable. It just, I, I don't know. I don't have any ideas on how we would do that. Um, the thing I was going to say is I think Jim's comment hit a real important jewel, which was 
anything that can be measured across everybody who contributes, I think is more of a responsiveness metric than a friendliness metric. And it felt to me like we've added a lot of things to friendliness that might be able to be in responsiveness because we can't measure them on a who's new versus who's established basis, uh, especially when we consider contributors who might only be doing drive-bys on the code, but might be very, very active on the calls or on the email list. Um, so uh, it, it feels to me like focusing or, or pushing more of the metrics over to the responsiveness side might give us a, a, a more uh, accurate view of what's going mm -hmm. on, um, in, in, at least in the case of like the no special treatment or um, there's a roadmap in place. Some of those things seem more like uh, fairness or responsiveness um, as opposed to maybe friendliness to new, new contributors. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay. That we could we could basically be uh, be more uh, objective, uh, measuring overall responsiveness. Cool. Okay. So Nathan, I agree with you. I don't think we can get you know perfect information on this, uh, but I think we can you know cut some of these. Uh, responsive, we, we can handle some of these statistics with respect to friendliness by looking at like statistics for maintainers versus statistics for contributors, right? Or statistics by company, right? Uh, because we have all of that information. Uh, so while some of these may be difficult, I, I think it's probably still possible to gather them. And, you know, I know that a lot of this stuff you can do with a couple of clicks in LFX right off the box. I, I say to that, yes, that sounds great. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, by the way, I see people are actually doing co-editing, so that's great. I know Rye has been encouraging people to, to do that on the, on the wiki. Um, so let's move on to, to code and see if we can finish everything uh, on time. Um, usefulness, um, is the project being adopted by customers and tie kickers? Uh, are people actually using, using them? Uh, I was actually thinking about this uh, when we were announcing end of life for Quilt. Um, do we actually know uh, if they are being used by customers? It would be great if we, if we do and say, yeah, um, it may be end of life, but it's, it's, it's still got strong uh, adoption. Um, it's just not moving forward in terms of uh, features. That's very different than a project that's been um, in Hyperledger and no one uses it, right? So I, I'm really curious, how do we get this? So uh, obviously we, we can ask and have people tell us, um, um, how do we do that is the question. Um, several things we could use. Um, Docker pose. Um, but this can be skewed, you know, if, if there are, you know, very uh, frequent test runs against particular projects, you're obviously going to get a lot of Docker pose that can skew the uh, the metrics, um, release binary downloads, probably the same idea. Um, and the next one was, uh, I think, an idea from uh, David, like we could tag um, resources that announce uh, the usage of a particular project and have that be tallied uh, in some fashion. Uh, and um, publications, um, particular project generates. Um, do we know if, if it's practical uh, to collect this? Uh, and do we want to create some sort of channel for our customers uh, and developers to tell us the projects they're using? 
like do, maybe we can organize some campaign um, with Davis department to to encourage you know encourage the world to, to tell hyperledger what they are using ideas like this any thoughts David. I mean, I think we, I mean, we can tap into, this could be an opportunity to work with the SIGs, for example, you know, we can just ask them if we give them a format for how to, as you say, tag things. I mean, we can try to, you know, encourage them to do that. I know that there's a lot of discussions about what's getting used for what, you know, solution and in, in the SIGs level. So I think that's where some of the data lives. And then we have the case study you know, library too, where that information is available. So those are, those are the thoughts that I, I had about where we can get this information. Nathan? I think we also have to acknowledge that some of the most interesting things we'll never find out about. And this is one of the reasons I really liked the hackathons that happened around the world, because often someone would show up who had not been on our radar at all in any other way. And they were doing something interesting but they wouldn't have talked to us if they didn't have an, kind of a local opportunity to do so. Um, so, I mean, we should make sure when we add this metric, we acknowledge this is what we know about. It's not everything that's happening. Yeah. Yeah, I think for the most part, this is, um, pulling information from, from the outside world, uh, unless we create some sort of channel and encourage people to do it, we probably will never find out. Okay, so it sounds like the, um, the, 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 um, the action here is, um, uh, I guess I'll work with uh, with David and Tracy and Hart and see if there are things we could do here. Um, I think it would be great if we if we can collect this sort of information. It's it's great marketing material uh, for the high pleasure brand. All right, cool. I wonder if the uh, certified vendors right <laughs> might be an interesting resource see what customers from their point of view are using which technologies. Maybe we can reach out to ask them. All right. Okay. Um, there is a list, uh, there's a distribution list that we can post to the HCSPs, but we Danielle, you're not oh. using the correct microphone. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Um, there is um, a list for the HCSPs, but the C HCSPs are just for Hyperledger Fabric right now. Um, but many of them do work cross projects. Yeah. Cool, and it'd be okay for us to contact them to to ask these sorts of questions, right, Danielle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We've... Awesome. That's great. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Uh, by the way, anybody is welcome to uh, to make uh, additional edits uh, after the call. So um, we only have four minutes left. Um, production readiness. Um, we want to see if it's already past 1.0. Uh, what's the test coverage of the code base? Um, do they publish performance and real, uh, reliability testing data? Uh, is the user documentation of high quality? Uh, anything else for this part? Bobby. Yeah, I just wanted to supply if we run out of time that the learning materials working group is currently creating um, a badging system for documentation um, to move from incubation to graduated status, you must have all the pieces 
Um, and we're working on that to present to the TSC in the near future. That would be a great thing to do. We would love to, to have a um, sort of a standard view to the quality of documentation. That it's it's very important. Thanks, uh, thanks for the working group for doing the for doing that. And and Jim, just um, because Dano's not here, he had last um, I want to say last season, um, the last term for the TC. Uh, it suggested a badging uh, proposal, but it never made progress. We might want to go revisit that as we mm -hmm. look at matching it up with what we're doing here with the project health um, to see if there's any additional sort of items that were included in that badging proposal that we should be including here. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd be all um, for helping with that because I know uh, from our own experience with Firefly, the team can definitely use uh, help on uh, what's the best way to write effective documentation, right? So this will be also very valuable to the to the projects because as developers, we know how to write good code, not necessarily write documentation, and and it's it can make a huge difference. Awesome. Um, so sorry, um, this is taking longer than expected. So I think we have to stop now. Um, I'll try to organize a off cycle um, meeting to continue uh, to finish those metrics. Uh, and again, everybody is welcome to, to do more edits um, and add your thoughts there. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for all the great discussions and back to you, Tracy. All right, thanks, Jim. Yeah, so, um... As Jim mentioned, feel free to edit this document, add additional items or commentary to it. Uh, he's capturing it under the task force um, section. There's a, the project health task force and he's got some meeting notes. So uh, feel free to edit that and get your comments available. And with that, I'm going to close the meeting for today. Thank you all for joining and we will see you again next week. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Fizzy. See you, everybody. Thanks.